Hello there, my name is Damien Wolfer Davis, and today I'd like to throw out some ideas around the prompts of cycling, creativity, commercialism, and the writing in the sand at Cannes. Now, the COVID lockdown of spring 2020 and the subsequent restrictions, local lockdowns, and so called fire breaks have made zealous cyclists, I think, of many who never dreamed of getting passionate about a bike. I'm passionate about a bike though my love of cycling began on a textual level, on the level of reading about it and writing about it much earlier, when I learned about the career and personal history of the great Italian Tuscan cyclist Gino Bartoli, born in 1914, died in 2000, to whom I'll return as the subject and exemplar of a TEDx tale in which I want to offer some thoughts relating to the creative lenses through which we might choose to see and connect up and challenge the world in particular, perhaps at moments of crisis. Now, I've found cycling to be like no other sport in respect of that textual element. How the very language of cycling and the cultural and imaginative space it occupies compel us to think beyond the material, beyond the sweat, tears, often blood, the brute mechanics of the sport, its contemporary commercial sheen, certainly, its increasingly huge industrial machine, beyond those, and engage with wider cultural frames of reference, inherited stories, larger narratives, swirling over time around the sport. Boxing might be the closest comparison here, perhaps. Or to put it differently, there's a fundamental tendency, I feel, towards metaphor in the culture of cycling, a desire to translate the micro into the macro, to trade in the part uh, in favour of a more dramatic whole, and to think not in terms of today, but rather in terms of a historic or mythic view. Now, as we know, as well as the so-called monuments, the five classic day-long races of cycling, road racing has its three grand tours. Three-week, 3,000-kilometre races, and racing is always measured in kilometres, not miles, Brits should remember, parceled into killing stages, that traverse and seem therefore to encompass and map and take the measure of, but always be thwarted by a whole territory. We have France, of course, Tour de France. The tour is known as La Grande Boucle, the Great Loop. Italy, the Giro d'Italia. And Spain, the Vuelta, meaning the return. Now, owing to their duration and their seemingly all-embracing geographies and their commitment to return in a loop, these are not so much sporting events for many as holistic cultural experiences. And the layered histories of these races are veritable social, economic, political, cultural histories of these countries, intimately linked fascinatingly with the newspaper industry and therefore with politics and the power of persuasion, opinion, rhetoric, words. These are histories in which class and economic opportunity, mobility, clearly in all senses, local and national aspirations, some dodgy narratives about progress and athletic prowess, all of them always undone by the exigencies, the accidents of the tour itself, and certainly dubious notions of a state's manifest destiny. All of those, down the years, have been entwined with bodies, with the sinewy, spittled, dust-caked, begoggled, spare-tube-carrying, at least in the early days, riders. That hasn't changed, it seems to me. It continues to be so, even in the case of the lycra body suited, hyper ergonomic, industry sponsored, Bluetoothed riders of today. I find it to be a haunting and haunted sport in which a continuum of ghosts hovers around each new rider. Therefore, when young Theo Hart dressed last week in Amalia Rosa, the pink jersey of the winner of the 2020 Giro d'Italia, stood there on the podium in Milan, the backdrop being that of the great Gothic cathedral in the iconic pink jersey, when he stood on that podium, cycling fans could see around him whispering their congratulations in their own faded, tattered pink, the ghosts of great Italian past winners, Alfredo Binder, Costante Girardengo, Gino Bartoli, Fausto Coppi. Key here is our sense of Grand Tour cyclists' relation to ground, to landscape. And the mythology, as we've inherited it, uh, builds that phenomenon as agonistic, in other words, as an ex existential battle, psychological, psychoanalytical battle, with the great climbs 
and legendary mountain passes, the Stelvio, Mont Ventoux, the Croix de Fer, the Isoar, the Père Azoud, the Tourmalet, all of those with its famous breakaway, its crashed and fallen riders, its shades, those challenges link riders and cultures across generations and across centuries. And then the colours, the colours of the peloton, the seemingly organic, moving main group of riders, shifting like a kaleidoscopic starling flock, the four coloured torsos of the Tour de France that sport yellow, leader, green, sprinter, polka dot, king of the mountains, and white, fastest young gun jerseys, becoming, if you like, mobile signifiers, snapshot histories of who is what and where in the race right here, right now. I've mentioned the newspaper industry and its links to the tour. Written, as it were, on Tour de France riders' very bodies is newsprint. The Tour de France's jersey is yellow in honour of the colour of the pages of Lotto Velo, the sports newspaper that very enterprisingly, at the beginning of the 20th century, not only sponsored the race but initiated it uh, as a marketing move. Though there is a counter-myth, a counter-claim that the race organisers found an unwanted job lot of yellow jerseys. I know which version I'd choose, which is precisely the point. Just as the body of the overall leader of the Giro d'Italia is pink clad in honour of the pink newsprint of La Gazzetta dello Sport. So again, these grand tours are tied inescapably to writing, to print, to debate, to an industry of comment and opinion, one that also availed itself, and this is important, of the values and tools of the literary and the poetic, as I'll suggest in a moment. It was the cultural critic Roland Barthes who distilled all this perhaps first in a 1957 essay entitled The Tour de France as Epic, published in a book wonderfully called The, the Eiffel Tower and Other Mythologies. Now he saw the tour as a veritable Homeric journey, an odyssey therefore, but also an Iliad, a narrative of a hero's rage, as well as his return home. And the Tour de France's return in its early days, to the velodrome of the Parc des Princes, and in modern times famously to the Champs-Élysées, enacts, one might say, an uncanny return of the very thing that one thought one had cast out, or lost, or said goodbye to. As John Madruga put, puts it, the conditions of the tour are readily seen and experienced as those, quite simply, of epic. He points out that the tour's geography for Bart is of the epic necessity of ordeal. And as Madruga says, the gradients are wicked, reduced to difficult or deadly percentages. The stages become an additive sequence of absolute crises, successive enemies, he says, individualised by that combination of form and mortality that defines an epic nature. The racer is at grips not with some natural difficulty, but with a veritable theme of existence. And for Bart, the tour rider is a god, quite simply voyeuristically viewed by the tour's audience, and Bart speaks of the concept of what he calls, very dramatically, the jump. Now, I interpret the jump as a kind of existential turbo boost, which, Bart says, erratically possesses certain races beloved of the gods and makes them accomplish wonders. Well, what kind of wonders? Well, as a racing fan, my list would certainly include the following examples. As when Jean Robic in the 1947 tour beat the leader Pierre Brambilla at the death in what's known as the miracle of Bon Secours, after which Brambilla reputedly buried his bike in his garden. Or when Fausto Coppi, ungainly off his bike but known as the Heron on it, as he did so often in the 1940s and 1950s, simply kicked and found himself magnificently alone for most of a race. Or to take a more contemporary example, when Chris Froome staged his unbelievable attack on stage 19 from Venaria Reale to Baronecchia in the 2018 Giro d'Italia, each joule, each watt of power and effort calculated in detail in dialogue with the team manager speaking through his earpiece, Dave Brailsford. And fascinatingly, for Bart, there is a dark twin of the jump, an ironic version, a parody Bart calls it, which he identifies as doping, something the apparent jumps of riders like Lance Armstrong shamefully hid, of course. Parody there is interesting. Again, Bart sees the tour in literary terms. So, 
Such a mythologizing, connecting, narrativizing, creative, if you like, view of the tour is, Madruga suggests, a very French thing, a typical French lens on the tour, in which other national cultures of sports reportage, other cultures of the journalistic and sporting imagination, are not perhaps so invested. This is the way Madruga puts it. He says, this may be the key difference of the French perspective of the Tour de France. What we witness over the course of three weeks are various forms of athletic, cultural, psychological, historical and literary immersion. That's the word. And not simply the advance of riders making their way stage by stage to Paris. The non-French media, he says, will inevitably comment on the tour on the level of advance, a view that is essentially static and linear. Now, I find that really, really interesting. We're in the realm here, from the French perspective at least, of an epic poem or a novel, not merely of sequential plot, a novel partaking of the epic, a realm of swirling connections and allusions, of haunted, haunting returns, despite the stage-by-stage -stage nature and apparent progression and teleology of the race as of literary plot. But of course we risk essentializing here in characterizing a national lens for anything. And yet perhaps there is truth in this claim. And the same kind of tendency towards narrative, myth and poetry, the same instinct to elevate the living contemporary race into an experience recognizable as a literary construct and as something legible, readable through literary tools the same kind of take is there for me in the journalism of the Italian novelist, painter and poet Dino Buzzati, whose account of the epic battle between Fausto Coppi and my hero Gino Bartoli at the 1949 Giro d'Italia, Coppi won, by the way, makes out of that famous battle, which was part of a rivalry that divided Italy, what are at base a series of impressionistic short stories. Now, this is journalism as quality creative writing, evoking the peloton in poetic terms. What beautiful colours, Buzzati says, they are wearing. They look like flowers. Or when he notices the black rags hanging over the fields to frighten the swallows. Or when he summons irreducible symbols and just lets them hang their resident, as in poetry, three monks under a poplar tree. Or for me, most dramatically, as the Giro passes the ruins of Monte Cassino, the site, as we know, of some of the most terrible fighting of the Second World War in Italy, when Buzzati has the dead crawl out to watch Fausto Coppi pass. Now, a writer like the Dutchman Tim Crabbe, author of The Rider, a superb account of a single race located in uncanny territory between non-fiction and creative writing, Tim Crabbe is another heir of the French-Italian lens on the Grand Tour. So this is an approach to sport and it's an approach perhaps to the world to which I'm attracted, even as I acknowledge the risks involved in that stereo view. And those risks, as I see them, are as follows. That we merely mythologise and not allow myth to test contingent, unplannable, unshapeable, brutal reality and vice versa. That we simply rarify and universalize and essentialize when only the swirling unprocessed here and now and only individuals are accessible and tangible to narrativize into a truth when there are so many contending versions to pitch us all towards a heroic return when there are plenty that fall by the wayside to enable that return and when the winner perhaps has foully reoxygenated his own blood as a poet i found those thoughts on the stereo nature of one's view of the world to be an invitation and a challenge. And it prompted me to begin another collection of poetry, and I'm currently completing what's rather unsatisfactorily perhaps described as a biography in verse of Gino Bartoli, where the desire to invest him with mythical status is always offset against the brutal reality of broken bodies, fascist Italy, which he despised, and hunted Jews. All the gods of the tour in the evening are poor bodies whose flesh needs kneading. Coming to cycling both as practice and as the subject of my writing shone a light on these contending lenses and the affordances of these lenses through which to write a biography of this kind. Take Bartoli's achievements and one recognises immediately a desire to elevate to myth or the, the temptation or tendency to do so. 
one in which his contemporaries, we know, avidly indulged, not needing the benefit of any historical gap. Take Bartoli's early race victories in Italy, the death of his beloved 19-year-old brother, Giulio, who, during a race, slammed into a black fiat, Bartoli's astonishing triumph in the 1939 Tour de France, his second win a decade later, pulled out of the bag, when, following the assassination attempt on Palmiro Togliatti, the leader of the Communist Party in Italy, Bartoli, on a rest day at the Tour, took a call from the Italian Prime Minister, who asked him to do something rather modest, to win the Tour, to bring Italy together and prevent a civil war. Bartoli took his team out to the beach in Cannes and drew the plan of the next day's racing in the sand. And that plan was simple, elegant, aggressive. It was constant attack. He won the tour. Let's talk also about his culturally defining rivalry with Fausto Coppi, who was taken by many to represent the new sexy modern modernist Italy as against Bartoli's old-fashioned, staunchly Catholic piety. Another example, actually, of our tendency to generalise because the reality of both men and the reality of the re reaction to them was far more complex than that. And most lasting, most important, most astonishing, most moving, Bartoli's role in saving hundreds of Jewish lives during the war by transporting forged identity documents in the tubes of his bike between Florence and Assisi, the site of a covert printing press, ah, the press again, while pretending to train in his yellow Tour de France jersey, and he was waved through Nazi and Italian fascist manned roadblocks, let him through. It's Gino Bartoli. For Hugh Dancy and Jeff Hare, the Tour is a pre-modern contest in a post-modern context. A corporate affair, an industry now sponsored by telecommunications giants, finance companies, but still subject to the paradigms of myth and of epic. And much of its compelling interest comes, I think, from the tension between these two existential, interpretative, epistemological, if you like, planes. Navigating multiple worlds of reference, recognising contending tendencies in us as readers and consumers of culture, to simplify and literalise on the one hand and to connect and elevate and metaphorise on the other, might equip us with the tools and the self-awareness with which to celebrate and, I hope, challenge the world.